Genesis chapter 3, we'll be focusing in just a moment on verse 15. There is an outline on the back of your worship guide if you'd like to use that to follow along with us this morning, entitled the message, The First Promise. The First Promise. As you're finding that in your Bibles and getting ready and preparing our hearts, I will remind you, uh, last week we've had a couple of different special services, special focuses here lately. Uh, Last week we had Logan Carter, uh, continue to pray for him. He has done an interview, some of you may have heard that, uh, and uh, looks at the prospect of a new job, a new position. Pray for him as he's waiting. Uh, He's he's reporting good uh, results in the interview, but has not yet heard a confirmation, so pray for the Lord's provision uh, in that way. Also, Daniel Alex's team was here uh, reporting uh, from the Slavic Baptist Church and Mission Ignite uh, up in Shakopee uh, and reporting on their recent trip to Guatemala. Daniel was telling me this morning he's not going on this trip, but the team that was up here, many of the members of that team are going to be leaving next month uh, for an opportunity to serve in Mexico. Uh, So hold them in your prayers if you'd like more information on how you could support uh, or Uh, Just continue to pray for them. I'm sure Daniel or Sam would be happy to uh, point you in that direction as well. But keep those folks in your prayers uh, as uh, they're going into next month. Anybody been watching the Olympics this weekend? A few of you. Some there's some people who are a little unhappy with some of the things in the opening exercises and, and this kind of thing. But my perspective is the athletes had nothing to do with that. Uh, And uh, I've been kind of interested watching the stories even before this opening exercise and all the the kerfuffle that was there. It caught my eye that Team USA preparing for the Olympics almost lost a game. If you saw this in the headlines a couple of weeks ago and they lost, they won by one point to a team that has supposedly seemed to have come out of nowhere, the team from South Sudan. Did anybody see this? Deb, Deb has seen this, <laughs> and she is very excited and without, with good reason as well. South Sudan in the Olympics is one of only two teams uh, competing from the whole continent of Africa in basketball. The other team that's competing in the Olympics is the Nigerian women's basketball team. And last night, they defeated Puerto Rico for their first ever Olympic victory. That was a pretty exciting thing. They've come from out of nowhere. South Sudan is still a relatively new nation, uh, and they're, they're, they're putting together a program, and they competed very heavily. In fact, uh, the Team USA ended up beating them by one point. In the halftime of that game, they led the United States with LeBron James and Steph Curry and all those uh, NBA All-Stars. They led them by 14 uh, at the half. It was a pretty unexpected thing. They're organized by a former NBA All-Star by the name of Wu Aldang, uh, and he is getting people from that war-torn country uh, where they're naturally uh, very tall, very uh, physically gifted, I suppose you could say, uh, but they don't have a lot of opportunity to develop themselves. And so he's called in some American coaches, including Royal Ivy, who is their head coach, Uh, who is an assistant serving with the Houston Rockets, and they're having a great deal of unexpected success. And there's an excitement there that even if you're not from from their their country, you're from the United States, just to see how they're doing because there's potential, there's promise, there's people helping them develop along the way, Uh, and people are being pulled into that story because of the promises because of the potential, because of overcoming challenges, because of being able to triumph over setbacks and defeat. And as we look at the text this morning, we're going to see that just like people are pulled into those kind of stories, there's something we can identify with, there's an interest there. We, too, can find that humanity's story, though there are setbacks, there are significant obstacles for humanity to overcome here in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. There is also the very first promise that God ever gives to humanity. In the face of these defeats, there is the promise 
of a Savior, the promise of a Deliverer. And God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. What we learn here in the context is just previous to this, God has confronted Adam and Eve for their sin. He has held them guilty. He has held them accountable for disobeying his direct command, you shall not eat of this fruit. What have you done? And you get dashed all the excuses, all the explanations that Adam and Eve offer, there is this conclusion, yes, I did eat. Maybe Adam says it's because of the woman. Maybe the woman says it's because of the serpent. But they said, I ate. So God begins to deal with the serpent in verse 14. The temptation that he presented, he says, because you have done this, verse 14, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And then I will put enmity between the two of you. And then what must be going through Adam and Eve's head as they're listening? If that's what he's done to the serpent, what's in store for us? There might have been this feeling already of guilt and shame that had driven them to hide, to run from the face of God with the sense of overwhelming guilt. And now, what is God going to do? Look what he's done to the serpent. It's crawling on its belly. It's, it's, it's not good for him. Where is it going to turn out for us? And yet, God does say there are going to be some problems. To the woman, verse 16, he says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. We'll go into more detail on that in succeeding weeks. But that doesn't sound quite like in the day that you eat of this, you shall die. What does he say to Adam? Verse 17. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So if you listen carefully to that last phrase that God says to Adam, eventually, Adam, you're going to die. You were taken from the dirt, you'll go back to the dirt. That's a reality. But if you think about it this way, as drastic as the consequences are for their sin, God is withholding the full impact of the consequences that he told them would happen in the day that they ate of it. I'm going to propose to you that, first of all, if you're using that outline on the back of your worship guide to follow along, this helps us understand that God is generous. God is generous because he is withholding the consequences. He is holding back a measure of what they deserve. Are there consequences? Is there going to be pain? Is there going to be suffering? Are there going to be weeds, thorns, and thistles? Are there going to be negative repercussions? Yes, there are. But God's mercies are still evident. God's mercies, his withholding the consequences which they have coming, which justice says ought to be theirs, they're at least delayed. And that's something that's important for us to remember here. It is consistent with the character of God that when he tells us that there is going to be consequences for sin, he is going to hold true to that. God is not a liar. God is not somebody who makes a promise and then reneges on it. But God does have 
his timing. God is a God of justice, but God is also a God of mercy. The book of Lamentations, Jeremiah writes this. I'm reading, first of all, from the English Standard Version, where we've been reading the text this morning. He says, the steadfast love, another phrase that sometimes is translated, is the mercy of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And many of us would know that old hymn, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. Sing with me. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Lifted right from this text in Lamentations 3. God's faithfulness endures. But there's some discrepancy sometimes in how this passage is translated. The steadfast of the love of the Lord never ceases is the ESV rendering. Some other translations, you're probably familiar with the King James, many of you. It says something to the effect of, it is of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Another modern translation that reflects that rendering is the Christian Standard Bible, and it says, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning, Great is your faithfulness. These are drawing from the same Hebrew text, but there is some discussion amongst translators, amongst scholars, whether it is the mercy of God that never ceases or that is not consumed, or whether it is the object, us, that's not consumed. Both truths, I think, are true. I would actually tend to favor the King James rendering the the Christian Standard Bible reading. It is because of God's mercies. It is because of his faithful love. We do not perish. And I think that's reflected here in God's actions to Adam and Eve. Right from the beginning. Right from God's dealing with humanity. There is the opportunity for him to wipe us out to obliterate us, and he would be justified in doing so. And yet, in his mercy, he gives us the opportunity to acknowledge, he gives us the opportunity to repent, he gives us the opportunity to be the platform to show not only his withholding, but his generosity in giving us hope in giving us an opportunity to overcome the justice that is demanded of the situation and find restoration, to find repentance and forgiveness. And that is what we find promised, started to be hinted at here in verse 15. He says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. That deliverer, the one who will come out of the human line, the one who will come birthed out of Eve, will bruise the head of the serpent. And what does that mean? That means that God is going to send this promised one, this deliverer, this savior, who is going to satisfy the justice of God and is going to justify those who have been declared guilty by God. And friends, that's something that may not have been immediately clear to their audience here. They wouldn't have understood exactly what God is talking about, but that is exactly what the New Testament writers would understand. When Paul would say, the God 
who sent Jesus is shortly going to crush the head of the serpent under his feet. That's something that he was giving them. He realized that on the cross, Jesus defeated Satan. Jesus defeated death. And he accomplished it again by satisfying God's justice when he said, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. How do we say that we escape that consequence? How can we know that that's not something we have to deal with? This is how Jesus himself would put it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish. They will not die. Instead, what will they have? Jesus says, they will have eternal life, everlasting life, life that never ends. Just like God created humanity to be in the first place. Humanity's position will be restored and that will be accomplished through Jesus Christ. This is how Paul puts it in Romans chapter 3 and verse 26. It was to show his righteousness, that is Jesus' righteousness, at the present time. So he lived a perfect, sinless life here on earth so that he might be just. He is perfect. He is completely and totally righteous. There is nothing that he has ever done that is worthy of God's condemnation. So he is the perfect, sinless son of God. He is the perfect, sinless human being that makes him to be in the position here in Romans 3.26, the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, that's what Jesus said in John 3.16. Whoever believes will have everlasting life. How is that accomplished? Because the perfect, sinless son of God died the death that you and I deserve. The one who never ate of the fruit, the one who never disobeyed, the one who never did anything worthy of condemnation died in our place so that we could have forgiveness, so that we could have life. He overcame the obstacle. He took one for the team. If we're thinking back to the over opening illustration, everybody likes to see a team get ahead and succeed, but we all know that teams sometimes require individual effort. How did Team USA ultimately end up beating South Sudan by one point. It was because LeBron James drove a layup with eight seconds left, and his basket, his individual action, put them ahead and helped them win the game. The whole team benefited from that. If he had lost, if he had missed the shot, the whole team would have also been penalized. They would have had the L. But that's not what happened. For Jesus to be able to do that, it helped all of humanity. Everyone who has faith in Jesus Christ can have the benefit of forgiveness, can have the benefit of God's grace, knows the hope that Jesus made possible. Because our deliverer has overturned the curse. This is what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to his cross. He took the death. He stood in our place so that we might be forgiven. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He crushed the head of the serpent. He overcame the power of the tempter. He defeated death and dismissed its consequences for us. Friends, this is the hope that God hints at, that we have seen fully and completely revealed, fully, completely accessible and fulfilled to us today. There is none righteous, Paul says, not even one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's what is made available to us. 
And the decision that is put in front of you this morning is whether or not you're going to identify with the side that leads to life or the side that leads to death. What does it again say here in in Genesis 3.15? As God speaks to the serpent, there is an enmity, there is an opposition between the serpent and the woman. There is an opposition, there is a hostility between the serpent's offspring and humanity. So, what side are you going to be on? Now, we have to talk through this a little bit and think through this. Does Satan have literal offspring? That's a little bit difficult to think through. Uh, you know, who, who, who is on the evil side, who is on the good side? Satan doesn't have children, so to speak, that are coming out of his system. He talks about in, in Scripture how Satan has a horde of demons. Well, where did the demons come from? They're created by God. They're angels who have fallen and are left with Satan and been cast out of heaven, as it t- talks about in Revelation. So who are these offspring of the serpent? Who are these offspring of Satan? And which side are you going to ultimately be on? Are you going to be on the side of the serpent, or are you going to be on the side of the Savior? Well, this is what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2. He helps us to clarify that those who are on the side of the serpent are those who are under the power and penalty of sin. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. So we were under the consequences of God's wrath for who we are, that is, children of Adam, children under sin, and what we have done, the desires, the passions that he speaks about, that we want to go against what God wants for us. We want to go against his commands. And if we doubt that, sometimes, again, we might look at a a child in innocence and say, that child, they're, they're just the picture of perfection. And yet, who teaches the child to say, mine, and be selfish? That's not a learned behavior. That's a natural instinct. That is present within our evil and corrupted hearts. Now, is everybody as evil and corrupted as they possibly could be? No. But does everybody have those tendencies? This is what it says. Everybody starts off in that same position. That's where we find ourselves, by default, under the power of Satan, under the power of sin, under the penalty of death. But that deliverer, is who has made us possible to be something else, something different. We continue to read in Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, we were already under the consequences of our sin, God has made us alive together with Christ. By his grace, you have been saved. He has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Skipping down to verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made by flesh in, in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. You were over in that left category. You are with Satan. You were under those consequences. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers to the covenants of promise. Having no hope and without God in the world. He's not trying to say that there's some kind of ethnic superiority for the Jewish people, but what he's saying is the Jewish people had access 
to the way of salvation. The Jewish people had access to the story that salvation is by faith in God and what God has done, the way that God has provided. And now, you Gentiles have access to that same hope, that same message. Let me tell you that story, and that's what we're doing here this morning. It is not by anything you can do to clean up your activity, friend, but it is by putting faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. It is by those who believe in Jesus. Because verse 13 of Ephesians 2 says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were on the left side, you who were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. In other words, what he's saying is that law, that law that told you whether it was not to eat of the tree, and you broke that wall of hostility, you created that thing by disobeying, by going against that law told you that you were a sinner. Because it's not us who's just eating the fruit. It's us who's disregarding. There should be no other God in our life but the God of the Bible, our Creator. That we should not bear false witness. That we should not commit adultery. We should not kill. We should not steal. We should remember to worship Him and not all these other things. We should be wary of some of the reasons why some of you probably aren't anxious to raise your hand in the living room. People blaspheming Jesus and making light and disregarding and mocking who He is. Friends, that is the default position of everybody without Christ. The only answer to the problems that face sin face humanity is what Jesus Christ has done. And this is what he tells us. We are preaching to you peace to those who are far off, peace to those who are near, who are under the exposure to the gospel. Through Jesus, we can have access to the Father. Through Jesus, we can have life. We don't need to be identified as those who are the offspring of Satan. We can be identified with Jesus. We can be called children of God. That's what John says in John chapter 1. Those are the ones he gave the right to be called children of God. It's who? Those who have believed in the name of Jesus Christ. Friends, what we want to remind you about this morning is that though the curse is placed on humanity, though the curse is placed on this earth, and we have reminders of that all around us every day in human depravity and wickedness. We have reminders of that every time you have to go out and weed your garden. <laughs> There's a reminder of the curse. Jesus, friends, reverses death, reverses the curse, crushes the head of the serpent, and makes it possible for you to have confidence, for you to have that sense of eternal life. That when this life is over, you pass into God's presence where there is fullness of joy. Your body will be resurrected. Some of us will even not face the reality of physical death, but will one day be caught up together with those who have been resurrected in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. And so we shall always be with the Lord. This is because death will be defeated. Death has been defeated because of what Jesus has done. The challenge we face because of sin is insurmountable on our own. But the promise of victory, of conquering the unconquerable, is ours through Jesus. With his help, because he is on our side, we can have life. We can have peace where there has only been death and hostility. Friend, has Jesus reversed the curse for you? That's why he died, is so you could have hope. And friend, if you do have hope, it's not just hope for you. It's hope and meant to be shared with others. Proclaim peace with God through Jesus Christ. and Let somebody else know about that hope today. We thank you, Father, for the hope that we have.
because of what Jesus has done. Knowing what we have done, knowing what Adam and Eve did in the garden, you made that promise because you are a God who is inherently merciful, inherently generous, a God of hope. We thank you, Lord, for that message of salvation, that message that death has been defeated, that life can be ours now and forever because of our belief, because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there is one here today who has never made certain of that or is trusting in their own goodness to get them out of this situation, help them to see that it is a futile pursuit, an empty endeavor. Help them to see that their only hope is Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray.